This is an oral history interview with Mary Ruth Snyder for the Purdue University Library's Archives and Special Collections. The interviewer is Sammy Morris and the date is May 29, 2018. Mary Ruth, thank you for allowing us to interview you today. My pleasure. If you could just start by giving us um, some background information on when and where you were born. Well, I was born in Brookville, Indiana, in Franklin County, down in the southern part of the state. Um, we lived there, <clears throat> well, my parents had gone there because my father had just graduated from Purdue and he was um, an agricultural extension agent and that was his first assignment. And uh, he had been there about a year by the time I was born. And we moved from there uh, when I was two years old. So I really don't have much memory of, of that place. Mm -hmm. I remember some things about the house. Uh, I remember being bitten by a dog, the neighbor's dog, on my nose. <laughs> that would be a bad <laughs> early memory. <laughs> traumatic experience. <laughs> um, I remember the tile on the bathroom floor. It was that tiny octagonal tile. Oh, you yes, know, that, yes. Um, and, you know, 60, no, um, 80 years later, more, I... Uh, first visited my son's apartment in New York and they had the same kind of floor tile in the hallway yeah. so I thought oh my goodness history is repeating itself but yeah. the buildings were probably built around the same time. Okay so what year were you, were you born? 1931. Okay so you were there until about 1933 or mm -hmm. so. Okay and what was your maiden name? Hadley H-A-D-L-E-Y. So did you go to school, where did, where did you go to, to school after that? Well, I started school after we moved to Rockville, or to Rochester, Indiana, up in Fulton County. Um, and I started second, or first grade there. They were on ha uh, semesters, so you could start in the middle of the year. And, um, but uh, in any case, I uh, started I guess I must have started in January or something like that mm -hmm. because <clears throat> I was kind of a half year ahead of the next school I went to, which was in Rockville, Indiana. So I had um, first and second grades in, well, kindergarten first and second, and part of second grade in uh, Rochester, and then we moved to Rockville where we were until I was in uh, starting high school. So most okay. of my schooling was in the little town of Rockville in Park County. Okay. Is that where you graduated high school? No. Um, we moved to West Lafayette in 1946, mm -hmm. and I was just uh, starting, uh, would have started high school in Rockville, but we moved before school started. So okay. I actually... Uh, started school and finished high school in West Lafayette. Okay. At that time, they had the ninth grade in junior high and then high school. So I see. I went to West Lafayette High School and graduated from there. So I'm assuming since your dad was an ag extension agent and then you lived in West Lafayette, you were already familiar with Purdue. Yes. Um, were there other factors that influenced your decision to attend the university there? Um, I had no intention or interest in even exploring any place else. So, mm -hmm. um, because as you suggest, um, actually, uh, he would be traveling up to Purdue frequently for meetings and that sort of thing, and he would—he um, never liked to do anything by himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so he often would, you know, even if he was working in the basement, he'd say, Mary Ruth, come on down and we'll work on this together or something like that. And uh, so I spent a lot of time, and I was the oldest child, so I got the first shot. Nice. And um, so I would ride up to Purdue with him every once in a while. So I was on the campus from an early age and... Um, my parents had lived there together when they were in school. Um, uh -huh. That's another story, but um, 
they were, my, my dad went to school for two years and couldn't afford to go anymore because he was putting himself through school and he had to work mm -hmm. to make money enough to go back to school or not. And um, so at that, in those two years, he was working as a cattle tester in the days when they tested cattle for tuberculosis. Oh, uh -huh. in, and he was assigned to do that in LaPorte County. And that was the home of my mother. And she was working in the same office at a different job uh, temporarily. And uh, she, um, and I, I guess I don't have quite all the details of that, but in any case, um, they met there and she, uh, and they married mm -hmm. uh, and she convinced them that he should go back to school and finish his last two years and she would, she would put him through college, you know. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, wow. um, so she worked as a teacher in West Lafayette and he went to school and finished. So then, <clears throat> that's then after that they moved to uh, Brookville and then that's when I was born. Oh. So, what was the first part of the question? No, that you answered it. You <laughs> did. I was just kind of asking what influenced you to go to Purdue. Oh, oh um, well, yes, that, you're right about that. Did you, did you have an idea of what you would major in when you first started, or did it take you a little time to, to think about it? I had a very it? definite idea. One of the people who worked with my dad <clears throat> in the uh, extension office was the home demonstration agent mm -hmm. um, who taught farm women how to do things in a more efficient and economical way. And <clears throat> I just idolized her. She happened to live kind of cat cornered across the street from us. So I would go over to her house and we'd do things together sometimes. And she was unmarried and, and had time to play with me, uh -huh. <laughs> I guess. And anyway, so I decided, you know, I wanted to be a home demonstration agent. And when I started investigating what I needed to take at Purdue to do that, they told me that I needed to take the closestly, most closely related, closestly, most closely related the thing was uh, vocational home economics teaching. So I said, okay, that's what I'll take. And um, <clears throat> I pursued that, even though I'd had a lot of other experiences and influences and so forth, that I maintained that goal. I never did that, but <laughs> I did teach for three years. It but sounds like she was quite an influence. What was her name? Do you remember? Uh, Ruth Talbot. Ruth Talbot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she... I think I have heard that name before. Mm -hmm. so. Well, did you live on campus when you were a student, or since your your family was close, did, did you stay I, home? I, well, I lived at home. I uh, Shortly after I got on campus, I, was, I participated in sorority rush. My mother had been a charter member of the Alpha Xi Delta chapter at Purdue when mm -hmm. she was in school in 1924-ish. And <clears throat> so, of course, she wanted me to join Alpha Xi Delta, and, and I did. But um, at that time, the campus was so crowded with, still with young men coming back from, who had come back from the war and were um, getting their education <coughs> through the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. um, they um, didn't allow people who could live at home to live on campus. If you had any place else to live, you had to stay there. I see. So the only time I lived in the sorority house was for six weeks when someone else was out student teaching or whatever she was doing. So, um, but I was on campus all the time because uh, I'd go to the sorority house, mm -hmm. study and whatever, and have meals at least once a week or a dinner. We had to do that. You were a member of a lot of different student organizations and groups and curricular <laughs> activities. Um, you must have seen my resume. I, I have quite a list here, and I just was wondering if there were any that you felt particularly passionate about or that you had particular memories that stood out. So I've got Theta Alpha Phi, Sigma Delta Tau, Omicron, Omicron Nu, The Play Shop, Kappa Delta Pi, Gold Peppers, Alpha Chi Delta, 
and mortar board? Well, I was very active in Purdue Play Shop. Mm -hmm. I started with that because um, before school started <clears throat> in my freshman year, I, being close to the campus, um, heard that they had a contest for the poster for Romeo and Juliet, that the, that was their first show that year. <clears throat> and um, I had been always been interested in art and I'd taken art courses in high school and <clears throat> we had done silk screens, which is the way they made their posters oh. in those days. <laughs> it was so primitive compared to what they do now. <clears throat> and um, so I th thought, well, you know, I'll just submit a design and see what happens. And um, I submitted my design and it won the contest. So the first thing I did in Purdue Play Shop was design their posters for, I don't know, maybe f four years, I don't know, maybe most of them anyway. <clears throat> and um, I would design them, but um, and make them as finished as I could, but the someone else would cut out the the screens for doing. I don't know if you know about silk screen, but it's a stenciling kind of process. You have a gel on a on silk, uh -huh. um, and you cut away the part that you want the ink to go through. You okay. peel away, you know, like you make a letter E and you peel away the thing and then when you roll the ink over it, the ink goes through at that point. Okay. So it's a resist uh -huh. process. And then if you want different colors, you have to make a separate screen for the other colors. So you don't want too many colors on it. Quite a process. So I you know, knew that you should only use, you can have the poster board be one color and then you can have another color and maybe another color, but you don't want to go much beyond that or they get mad at you. <laughs> so <laughs> it just takes longer to print. So anyway, I did that. And then um, in the second year, I guess, I got started in the makeup department and I was head of stage makeup from then on and um, invented some ways to do that more efficiently, like uh, instead of having a central location for all of your supplies and having people come to you and get made up, uh, I made boxes for, of supplies for each actor and they could put on their own base and that sort of thing and I'd just go around and shallow their cheeks or put in the wrinkles or whatever they needed. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And the last, I think it was the last year, junior year or senior year, we did Macbeth and I did, we made wigs and beards for all the actors. Everything in the costuming was done as much in period as possible. And some people were very busily knitting very large needles, very coarse yarn, to make chain mail vests. And they sprayed them with aluminum paint, and it really did look like chain mail. Wow, that's <laughs> it was really very well done and very clever. So you all would make all of the costumes and... We didn't, we, the, yeah, I didn't do costumes, uh -huh. but, uh, I mean, I could have, but I was busy with makeup. Um, but, yes, they, well, they didn't make all the costumes, but they would certainly remodel things. And, uh -huh. and some shows were in contemporary times, so that was okay, but, uh, yeah, they, if, I'm sure that for the costuming, they made a lot of those costumes. Right. Yeah, and the men were wearing leggings and fake boots and that sort of stuff. <laughs> Were there any rituals or pranks behind the scenes that would occur? Well, one of which was, um, I don't think I ever did this. Maybe I did once, but um, the, that building, Old Fowler Hall, had a an underground area, which was not finished. It was just, you know, the sub area. And... Um, but they used it to store things in because you always need places to store things. So they would make the freshmen go down and do a scavenger hunt or something in the 
bowels of the fowler hall. <laughs> so if you made it out of that. You were, yeah, you, if you survived that, you were okay. Nothing very mm-hmm. bad. It was just a kind of a fun ritual. That sounds fun. So where were most of your classes held, or were they kind of scattered all over? Well, um, of course, Matthews Hall was the first home economics building, Mm -hmm. and Stone Hall was a new building uh, after that. And um, so most of my classes were either in Matthews Hall or... If it was an English class, it would be, you know, over in Haviland Hall or wherever. Mm-hmm. Uh, the campus was not as large as it is now, so, he, but uh, we lived on Evergreen Street, which is up by the field house, the basketball yes, area. Uh-huh. And um, so I would never, I mean, you can't drive on campus, so yeah, I would walk from that part of town down to Matthews Hall every day. Mm-hmm or wherever I was going. Okay. Did you have a favorite student tradition when you were on campus as a student? Well, um, I don't know what you mean exactly by tradition. Um, I participated in all the things that the sorority was involved in. Mm -hmm. So, we didn't have fuzzy football at that time. <laughs> we weren't allowed to wear slacks except when the winter was really, really bad oh, and cold. That was part of the dress code. That was the, it wasn't real, I don't think it was really, well, yeah, that was at that time. I don't know, think you would have been kicked off campus if you'd <clears throat> worn pants, but it was not custom for mm-hmm. sure. And, of course, we had hours, so we had to get back in at a certain time, which I could avoid because I lived off campus, which was convenient (laughs) sometimes. It was convenient because I would be working at Play Shop until midnight and then come home. Sure. But And, of course, those days you didn't worry about walking across the campus at midnight by yourself, Mm -hmm. uh, which was a good tradition. Um, (laughs) I was not very involved in athletics. I'm not athletic, Um, but um, so I I went to the football games and I enjoyed them and basketball games and that sort of thing. But as far as um, you know, burning (coughs) uh, Miss Indiana at homecoming time, you know, you'd go to the bonfire and that throw Miss Indiana on the flames, and there were things, things like that. Everybody yes. did. Was that like a mannequin, or what, what yeah, was? Yeah, well, it, uh-huh. they probably found some mannequin from a department store. Uh-huh. You know, I, don't, I didn't have anything. Fraternities did that stuff, you know. So for certain certain years in the yearbooks, they would show pictures where she would lie in state at the union. Oh yeah, do you remember would, this? Oh yeah, she would be in a casket on <laughs> in the main, in the main lobby of the union building. And what were the, the students' role? Just to come visit her there? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it was very respectful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> if there were visitors, they probably didn't pray, except maybe to pray to Purdue One or something right. like that. But. <laughs> so is it is it right that you graduated in 1953 with your degree in home economics education? Mm-hmm. What did you do following graduation? Well, actually, before graduation, I got married. Oh, uh-huh. And <clears throat> I had my eye on the big man on campus. He was a... Um, he was the male National uh, Achievement Award winner in 4-H. He'd grown up on the farm and raised Angus cattle and uh, had um, achieved that pinnacle of success. He had his own radio program where he, in agriculture, of course, it was on WBAA every morning, he would read the... Uh, prices for stock, livestock and grain on the radio. 
Um, I, I don't think he did anything original he, much anyway. <laughs> but that was something that was important to the farmers and they all wanted to know every morning, you know, whether the prices had gone up and, or down. And oh, That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you don't do that anymore. Uh, you, you look it up on your computer. But um, so he was kind of famous. He was an ag uh, AGR, and their house was two houses from my sorority house. So um, is still, that how you it met? still is, as a matter of fact. Oh, that's Breck working on the yard. <laughs> he's cleaning gutters. Oh, yes. Uh, well, he's finishing yeah. cleaning gutters. <laughs> Make sure this is a little bit closer to you. Yeah. So, so good. tell us for the record this, this young man's name and how you, how you met each other. Oh, I, I just didn't think about it. I don't really remember how we met. We probably met at a party that the AGRs had with the Alpha C Delvis. Or uh, one of my good friends, who is still a friend, um, was going with an AGR, and she was a year ahead of me, so they might have introduced us. I don't remember, okay. really. But the AGRs and the Alpha C Delvis were always doing things together. We were close by, and intermingled. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one of the things I remember, of course, since it was a nice thing for me, was he took me to their Christmas dance and I was voted the best looking or whatever. Oh, yes. <laughs> the snowball queen. Snowball oh, queen. Lovely. <laughs> Now, were these the days where you had dance cards that... No, knew? no. I have a collection of my mother's dance oh, cards. Oh, Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe that petered out after that. that. Um, yeah, I don't think that lasted <laughs> much longer than that. That's so it wasn't sure. quite that formal, it no. sounds like. Um, okay, so you were married while you were still a student. Mm hmm And what year was that? 1949, well, 1951. 1951. So, so kind of midway. It was between 52. Yeah, I was. I was. I was at, between my junior and senior year. Did Did you have any um, suggestion or pressure that you should quit school after getting married? Or? Oh, I had no intention of quitting school. Uh -huh. He had, was in the ROTC and was the first lieutenant and had to go serve his two years uh, after graduation. So mm -hmm. he was he was going to be gone the next year anyway. I see. And um, I was <coughs> going to finish, which I did, uh, my senior year. The funny thing was that um, it was unusual for women to get married before they graduated and come back, mm -hmm. So, um, as you suggest. So... Um, one of the things that I still was required to do at my senior year was to go to home management house. And um, we were required to live with five or six, seven other, I remember there were eight of us or six of us in the house at the time, and be, pretend to be a family, and we had to plan our meals and cook meals uh, for the whole group and um, clean the, keep the house clean and do the laundry and all that stuff to have an experience in home management, mm -hmm. which is actually a very good idea. And doing it in college, I mean, I think they should do it in high school, but anyway, the world has changed to the worse, as far as I'm concerned, because yeah. I'm old and stodgy. and you know. <laughs> So... Um, Anyway, it was funny to me because, number one, I knew how to do all these things anyway, having lived at home and helped at home, and my mother taught us how to do everything because she thought that was important, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we helped, you know, always helped at home. So, um, <clears throat> and of course, the other girls were less experienced and I got a bit impatient with them sometimes, but anyhow. Did each of you have roles that you were supposed to play? We did, we, but we, they changed every day or every whatever. Certainly, I don't remember even how many weeks we were doing this. but uh, 
so it rotated. It rotated. Where was the house? The, there were several. I mean, there was more than one, I believe. Um, and they were, where were they? I have any idea. West of campus a little bit, but okay. I, don't, I don't remember whether they were just in a neighborhood or whether they were Part of especially on campus. I had, they had to be on campus, but they may have been houses that already existed. I see. Okay. Um, so after you graduated, what was your next step? Well, um, my husband came home from... He actually came home early because his father was ill and was having difficulty taking care of the farm. <clears throat> um, but in any case, we lived on the farm, um, and I taught school at Morton Memorial High School, which is in One Night's Town, Indiana. And it's a, it was, it's, it still exists, but it's not for this purpose anymore. It was basically um, an orphanage for, so it was it's called, or was called, the Soldiers and Sailors Children's Home. And the children, the original idea was that if a, a man was killed in the war and had children and his wife couldn't take care of the family, she could send the children to this home. Okay. And, or the uh, state could send, or the, could send the uh, child to the place if it were abandoned or ill-treated or whatever. I see. So sometimes the parent would be, a parent at least, would be alive. Uh, and then later it also was, I mean, any child that was a child of a military person could be sent there if the child was not being taken care of by okay. the family. So some of the children who were there had been there for many years, were basically raised there from infancy. I mean, it's possible if they would raise from infancy. Because they could be adopted out of there, mm -hmm. and often were. Or a family member might be able to take care of them after they got a little farther along and take over. But, and, and sometimes, <clears throat> as the children got older, um, they would, um, particularly, well, the girls and boys, in the summertime they would go help out another family, like be a nanny or work on the farm or that kind of thing, and the family they worked for would take care of them, would not necessarily adopt them, but would have them live with them instead. So I see. Some kinds of those things happened, but in any case, uh, there were enough kids there that they had all ages of children, mm -hmm. and they <clears throat> lived in households that were taken care of by, a, they would have a house mother kind of person in that little house, and so they were trying to replicate a family situation as best they could. Okay. And <clears throat> so I really respected the way they were handling things. The wife of the superintendent uh, was kind of in charge of things that had to do with the girls. So, for example, she required that the girls make a prom dress that would be suitable for them to wear after they got out of high school. Oh, uh -huh. So their prom dresses were gingham or small print flower cotton dresses, very simple, and very practical, but not very prom me. <laughs> uh -huh. So when I went there, I only taught there for three years, so maybe it wasn't the first year, but anyway, uh, I convinced her that we could figure out ways to make dresses like other girls wore to proms. And uh, so she, she approved buying the taffeta and the net and... Um, the boning and everything, because in those days they wanted strapless dresses with uh, fitted bodices and flowing skirts, fluffy skirts, underlined with taffeta. And a lot of fabric. A lot of fabric, and not necessarily cheap fabric. So 
And then, of course, we had some rhinestones and uh, <laughs> some rather gaudy styles, but I let them pretty much design what they wanted. And um, you had to have bonings for the strapless dresses and zippers, of course. And But by the time, of course, I didn't have them in sewing class until they were sophomores anyway. So I didn't have much time to give them much experience. But um, so some of them were rather um, sketchily made. <laughs> it's a good thing they didn't have to last very long, let's put it that way. <laughs> that was fun. So what, what prompted you to leave that position? I got divorced. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had a baby, so I um, didn't teach for another after couple I only taught for the first three years and then I had a baby and then I didn't teach the next year and the home situation was not good so um, I took my daughter and left <laughs> and went went home to mommy went home to my parents and lived there for a year or two um, maybe three uh, anyway, um, fortunately, I was granted by the judge um, a, a the um, amount of money that I had earned teaching. Um, <laughs> so I had like I, I was only getting three thousand dollars a year f for teaching in those days. So I had like nine thousand dollars out of my divorce. <laughs> and a child to raise, uh -huh. but I could, was living with my parents, and I started, that's when I started my master's program, because I was there, and I didn't know what I was going to do, and I had a child, and so, anyway. Was it difficult to get into the master's program with a child, or was that something that anyone asked about? Okay. Not that I remember. Okay. So at, at what point did you, uh, so, so you completed your master's degree, and then what did you do after that? What did I do after that? Well, um, actually, um, at just shortly after I finished my master's degree, I, that fall, I met a guy that I married, James Snyder, Mm -hmm. um, I went to a, they used to have a big event, a picnic kind of thing, in the stadium uh, for new faculty and so forth. And um, my dad said, he was on the staff at this point, my dad had come to live in West Lafayette and work at the university uh, as a farm management specialist. So we've been living on the campus for since 1946, and anyway, he said, "Why don't you go to this picnic with me, with us?" My mother was going to, and um, I said, "Okay." And um, he introduced me to these two young bachelors who were the hot men on campus, <laughs> as far as faculty was concerned, at least in that department. Uh -huh. And um, they would jump in there in his uh, white Thunderbird, I was trying to think of the year, 1961 Thunderbird, and uh, drive up to Chicago and date the girls up there. And his friend Hugh married one of the Chicago girls. But uh, Jim married me instead. So, which was a, another whole thing because he was Mennonite and he was from Canada. He'd graduated from Guelph and had come to Purdue and gotten a doctorate. He had just gotten his doctorate. And um, he was staying at Purdue, hired by the Department of Agricultural Economics. Um, so, and he was teaching. Uh, so his Mennonite family had to think really hard about, he was really faced with the possible of excommunication from the Mennonite church for marrying a divorced woman. So 
his oldest brother, and there was only three of them, um, came to West Lafayette to meet me to see, and his brother was a, a Mennonite preacher, so he was qualified to make this decision. So he came to meet me to see if he approved and thought that they should appeal and make sure that Jim wouldn't be excommunicated. <clears throat> And really, it all went very well, and I've always had a really good relationship with the family, and we'd go back, we would go up there quite frequently, and, um, take all the kids in the station wagon and go up and see Grandma and Grandpa and so forth. So that, oh, and I'm still close with his younger brother, who's still living, so, and his family, and our, their cousins are all close and so forth. So. It's all worked out very well, but it was really funny at the beginning. I was almost rejected. <laughs> that would have been a stressful meeting, I think. <laughs> no, I didn't even really know of, that that was in the works until it was over with. <laughs> so with, were you married while you were, after you received your master's, or was that while you were getting your degree? I was, I had just finished my master's by that time. It. Okay. And then I, I didn't work for pay. Uh, I put that in there. Right. Uh, <laughs> you were working. <laughs> with, um, during the time I was having, I was 10 years between the time that I quit it. During the time that I um, was getting my master's degree, I was also working at the uh, School of Home Economics as an academic advisor. So I still had that job while I was after I got my master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I basically was hired, you know, on the staff officially, not on an assistantship, after I got my master's degree. The dean said, can you hurry up and finish your degree so I can hire you? <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of crammed that into two years. Oh, well, that's great. So you... Um at what point did you enter the workforce again? You said well, it was about a 10-year gap. Just, um, let's see, I had my last child, uh, Jay, in 1970. Okay, I should fill in that during that 10 years I had uh, two daughters and a son. Uh, Olivia, Emily, and Jay. Okay. And I already had Betsy. So, yeah, okay. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> Jay it was born in 1970, and my husband died in 1974. Mm -hmm. So, I had um, just the, in February, I think it was, before he died in June, I had started working part-time for the Purdue Alumni Association. I had decided between starting a PhD, I mean, Jay was just old enough to be in nursery school and, you know, I thought I could start doing something to fill my time <laughs> since I didn't have anything else to do but raise four kids and whatever. But anyway, um, so I, um, decided to make a choice between starting a PhD or getting a job. And at the time, um, I was a little shaky about getting a PhD because I knew I had to take statistics. Mm. <laughs> and my husband was a math genius, and he thought that was hilarious. Uh -huh. He said, I'll help you with that, don't worry. <laughs> so, but anyway, I chose, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll see about getting a job. So, I surveyed the opportunities and things that I like to do and <clears throat> the only kind of thing that I was very interested in um, and thought I had background in that I could sell um, was related to working with people and um, because I've been very active in various organizations and so anyhow I put together a proposal to the Purdue Alumni Association of things I thought that my background and their needs mm -hmm. meshed. 
and I got all prepared for this, and I got all dressed up, and I go to interview, and I knew the guy that I was going to interview a little bit because they lived just up the street from where we did. But that's all I knew, really. I didn't. I don't think I'd ever really met him or anything. His wife and I knew each other and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They were neighbors, but I really didn't know him very well. Anyhow, I go in to talk to him about this, and of course he's blown away by this preparation. <laughs> and, and anyway, I got that job. And he had a woman, a young woman, who had just graduated, who had probably worked for them, I think she had worked for them, uh, while she was in school, just doing what needed to be done. And uh, then, he, then he hired her after she graduated, and um, he had her uh, organizing and making arrangements for people who went on our international travel program. And I don't know what else she did, not much at that point. But anyway, um, I sort of took her job. She was mm -hmm. leaving, and her I think she got married and was going to be gone. So that position was available. And I convinced him that I could do what she was doing full-time in half-time because I still needed to be at home part of the time with the kids coming home from school and that sort of thing. So I worked for half time for a couple of years and then I worked three quarter time for the rest of the time I was there. <laughs> but we called it half full time because I was really doing a full time job. But the point was I, I had job flexibility really was the arrangement. I uh, was paid full time for full time but I could take off Tuesday and Thursday afternoons so that I didn't, because I couldn't get Jay in, in child care all of that time, mm -hmm. or nursery school or whatever, and then of course he went to school and blah, blah, blah. So anyhow, that was the deal. So <clears throat> when he, Jay got in, time, in school full time, I decided that I could take Thursday and thir Tuesday, Thursday afternoons, or their equivalent, to take classes. Mm -hmm. And why not work on a doctorate since I already had a master's degree? And what would I be interested in? Well, I thought maybe, are you ready for this? I'm kind of beyond the no, question. That's, that's great. All right. So um, I, I thought that I was interested in uh, still in education. Um, so I talked to the I in the School of Education, and when I found out that I had to take 60 more hours in, of education courses, which were too wow. boring for words, <laughs> I said, uh, is there anything else I might do? Uh -huh. I said, how about, uh, I was talking about education administration, and um, because that, in, and I was just thinking at the secondary level. And um, so he said, well, you're really interested in administration and you have all these courses. And so I wanted to point out that during my, ma my bachelor's and master's degrees, I always took as many English courses as I could. Mm -hmm. I got a second teaching license in English, when I w which they said was impossible, but of course, that made Jimmy want to do it, uh, and I didn't it's ever. A close. Challenge, right? I just took extra hours to do it. Twenty-one hours. I mean, now nowadays they think fifteen hours is a full load. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so I already had a second license in teaching English, and then when I was getting my master's degree, I took communication courses, and um, so I. Um, had that already in background. So he said, it looks to me like um, you would be interested in organizational communication in the communication department because you can take some courses at Craner for administration mm -hmm. and you have your communication background. I said, well, that sounds good. So I go over and talk to the guys over there. And uh, they were very interested in my background and and my connection with Purdue mm -hmm. and my access to 
40,000 alumni that we sent messages to several times a year. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that be an interesting idea for a, a doctoral <coughs> dissertation? So anyhow, that's why I went that direction. Okay. And what did you end up doing your dissertation on? It was kind of a marketing study, really. Um, uh, we took a study that had already been done and approved and so forth that provided a method for measuring people's world views of the world. And some were more interested in things that were structured, like engineers, and some were very free-floating, hang it out there and let's see what happens, <coughs> which are more like the liberal arts people. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a couple of other categories. So we, we could test people on that, or we could make a design of survey of sorts to uh, see what kind of messages they responded to. So we designed our membership mailing membership in the Purdue Alumni Association mm -hmm. that we sent out all four times a year. Um, we designed those with messages that were approved by my committee to be focused in those ways. So at the extremes we had, you know, the ones that were more structured for the engineers, all the engineers, which of course we could identify by their schools. And then we had the more flippy floppy ones for the <laughs> for the liberal arts people and so forth. And um, so we sent out the mailings to 40,000 people and s could tell how they responded because they either paid their dues or they didn't pay their dues, you know. Uh -huh. And um, we had, um, ac I had access, of course, to the mailings and to the uh, people who received the memberships because we count so we could count you know how many responded and guess what it worked we actually got better responses when we designed the mailings this way uh, and my major professor kept assuring me that after all this work it didn't have to succeed you just had to go through the process and report it the whole idea was to perform the experiment mm -hmm. and, and then and report the results, whatever they were. You didn't necessarily have to be successful. But it was, which was a bonus. And he was a real stickler for getting over a 50% response. Mm -hmm. He said, if you don't get a 50% response, you don't know what's going on. So we got a 67% response. Oh and um, so he was very happy with, with all that. So were there survey questions but geared towards the different disciplines? Is that what it was? No, no. You just you designed a message. You said, the reason you want to belong to the Purdue Alumni Association is because we do this, 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 and this. Or, well, we do this, we do that, and we I do see. something else. So you were communicating kind of the it same was, concept. It was a communication uh, example of how you can design messages to get people to respond positively. Interesting. And did you find it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yes. Yeah. I was surprised. It was a so anyhow. That was what that was all about. Do you know if the alumni association ever continued to communicate in that way after you proved that that was successful? No. That's interesting. <laughs> I'm sure it was a tremendous amount of work to try to identify the major of each person that you were. No, they, we have that on record all the time. Uh -huh. It comes right out on, spits it right out. We were okay. computerized by then, okay. so we uh -huh. had that. That was the easiest uh -huh. part. I mean, everything, I mean, if you read the, I haven't checked this lately, but usually uh, in an alumni magazine, mm -hmm. whenever an alum is mentioned, the year of their graduation and their school will be after, in parentheses after their name because we know that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't thinking you would be computerized by then. That's, ah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. so. Actually, um, we were computerized on, on computers that were designed by Purdue engineers, electrical engineers. Really? 
and um, we were, uh, you know, we weren't first out of the box, but mm -hmm. it was one thing that we had early on. How did your, I know that you moved up in different positions throughout the Alumni Association, how did your job responsibilities change over uh -huh. time? Well, <laughs> You'd have to know Joe Rudolph, my boss, to understand this. And <laughs> but Joe was, he started out as like a manager in one of the athletic programs. You know, was, a lot of the alumni guys were former coaches and that sort of thing because they kept in touch with their people because a lot of them would go into professional athletics and then they become famous or not. Anyway, they were good old boys. And um, the first first alumni program, William and Mary, uh, was started, you know, in the 1800s uh, by a university administrator who wrote letters to former students. Mm -hmm. And then he had so many students that he would print a little newsletter type thing. That was the first way they communicated and kept in touch. And, and, um, and the university needed a little money, they'd ask them for money and they'd give them money. And of course the president would go make a call on them and pat them on the back and tell them how wonderful they were, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that was how it all started. And uh, in most private institutions, private colleges, uh, and this is still true in the smaller ones today. The person in charge of alumni relations is also the fundraiser. As universities got larger and got more complicated, the roles were split so that one group could follow up on just communicating with alumni, going out and telling them what was going on, and keeping building relationships. And the fundraisers came in, swooped in, and picked off the ones that would give a lot of money. And they got a lot more credit for it than the alumni directors. That's another story. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, mm -hmm. what was that first part of the it was, question? It was about how your work evolved, and you said it related to your boss, Rudolph. Joe Rudolph. Thank you. Well, Joe was pretty laid back and not, he wasn't trained as a professional, anything really in that regard. And But he did keep he was a good old boy with the other directors of um, alumni relations in the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. They had this club, and uh, so he picked up ideas from them, and they would razz him and encourage him to do stuff. Um, so we had an international travel program, and we had a very large, one of the largest in the nation, alumni club program where because he would go out and visit these alumni clubs and his assistant Jack Carl would take half of them and he'd take the other half but Joe always got the ones in Florida in the winter time <laughs> that's a hard gig isn't it <laughs> so uh, early on one of my responsibilities became visiting some of these alumni clubs because we had like 130 or something oh, godly nice. number well, maybe it was over 100 anyway. So, uh, and after I came on board and been there a year or two, we'd sit down with Jack and Jay, and J Joe and Jack and I would sit, sit down together. And we would say, okay, well, I'll take this group. And I went there last year, why don't you take this group? And we'd kind of take an area of the country so we could not have to travel too far between them. And um, so and Joe always took Florida, and Jack and I would divide up the rest, and Joe would take one or two others, you know, that sort of thing. And um, in, within the year, we would have visited each alumni club, and we would take with us the newsreel for, and they still do this. Um, of course, they probably do it on a computer now, but take the little thumb drive, but we would actually take our reel with us of mm -hmm. film. It was a compilation of film that had been taken through the year that was put together by the whatever department it was at that time. 
Um, and every club would rent a projector. Every projector was different, you know, so somebody had to run the projector. I never really did much of that. So anyway, uh, and then we'd give some remarks and pal around and have dinner and that sort of thing. Go on to the next. <laughs> so during the time I would be gone, for a week maybe at a time, or four or five days anyway, uh, my oldest daughter, Betsy, was in college by this time, so she would come home and take care of the kids, <laughs> the rest of the kids, while I was gone. So my kids grew up taking care of the, each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were your different positions with the Alumni Association? Do you remember? Well, I started out as an administrative assistant. Uh -huh. Then I was an assistant director, mm -hmm. and then I was an associate director. Okay. And then I, uh, when I went to Rutgers, I became a director, the director, vice president for. Were there any changes or um, major goals and accomplishments that should really stand out for you as, as things that you did during your time at the Alumni Association? Well, at Purdue, of course, I wasn't in charge, so mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, I, I kept what I, you were asking how my job changed. Um, mostly, uh, I would tell so, well, at Illinois, they're doing it this way, or at Michigan, they're doing it that way. How about we try that, and I'll take mm -hmm. over and try it with mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, for example, we had, um, earlier on, we had um, a company that was uh, offering insurance for alumni Mm -hmm. at reduced prices, like $10,000 of insurance for $100 or something. I don't know. Uh, for the first few years, they get them hooked and whatever. <clears throat> so, and then, of course, the Alumni Association got a percentage. And um, so we took that on, uh, made a lot of money. Um, and, of course... It, the Purdue Alumni Association is called an independent alumni association, but the university furnishes the space and some of the staff, and, and we share a magazine and all this stuff now. And even in those days, we were subsidized to some extent. Um, but the dues had to pay the rest. So if we could make money on tours or insurance, those were the two big ones, um, that was helpful. So, um, when I got involved in case, that was another situation where Joe was not involved at all. He didn't ever go to the case meetings. He, he would go to the Big Ten meetings, but he wasn't. He just thought case was for development people and communication people, and he didn't see that it was doing anything for us. And to some extent that was true because we already had our own alumni circles that we learned from and that was really basically all that was going on. So I was interested in it and I knew that they were particularly working on um, the role of women uh, in alumni relations as well as um, as alumni becoming involved. Mm -hmm. So I asked if I could go to some of these things. And, uh, yeah, okay, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll pay your hotel bill, what we do, if you can drive okay. <laughs> to Chicago, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how we started out. So, um, I re as, all the time I was at, at Purdue, I was really the only one that was very involved with CASE. Um, and I became uh, active, and there are some stories there, but um, one of the things, I, I was 
conscientiously trying to find if I had any records of my involvement with Case. Um, and I really don't. I have mm -hmm. pared down, I've moved, and you know, that's, that's another life. And, and they have all the, the records, so why should I keep them anyway? Sure. But what I did find <laughs> were two things. Why? I don't know. This was happened to be with some other certificates and things. Oh, yes. I didn't even know I had it. <laughs> it was just a recognition of doing a workshop, which had nothing to do with much of anything. I was chairman of the convention, or of the alumni relations portion of the convention one year. That may have been part of that, I don't know. Do you remember what year you became involved with CASE? Um, well, I was on the Board of Trustees from 1983 to 1985 <laughs> as a, a Vice President for Alumni Relations, which was in itself kind of unusual because I was still just an Associate Director. I was not the Director mm -hmm. of the Alumni Association. What led up to you leaving Purdue to become um, eventually Assistant VP of Alumni Relations at Rutgers? Uh -huh. Um, well, the development director, no, not that she wasn't the director, but uh, one of the development officers who's a good friend of mine, um, and they had just started the development program at Purdue, probably in 82 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, came to me one day and she said, we were, I don't know, having lunch or something, and she said, you know, there's really no future for you here at Purdue. Joe is not going to retire for a few more years, and even when he does, they're never going to hire a woman. Mm -hmm. And I got thinking about that, and I thought, well, that's true. Uh, my kids were, my, my youngest was my son, and he was starting. Um, he was just finishing elementary school and and ready to go on to junior high, high school, or whatever. Um, my daughters were all either in college or out of college or someplace along there. They're all four years apart, so that works out nicely. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and... Um, I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to make any changes, I'm going to—I should do it pretty soon. Uh, I got to decide whether I just want to stay here and be an assistant director, and then somebody else comes in and I work for them, or I go and see what I can do on my own. Mm -hmm. I was getting pretty bored with what I was doing. I only have about a three-year attention span, you know. <laughs> If I haven't gotten it done in three years, forget about it, you know. So, anyway. So there wasn't really any major push for it. Um, other friends and other directors had been, you know, saying, oh, why don't you get out there and see what you can do? That sort of thing. And, you know, I was a single parent, but my kids were getting out and getting on. Uh, so, uh, up to that point, I had been pretty much being very concerned about being settled and keeping things supportive for the kids and not making too many other changes. But at that point, I was getting to be f more flexible. And um, so, um, the first thing that happened, really, was that I got, a, uh, and this was early on in this process, I got an invitation to apply for the position at the, I mean, because other people knew that I was at this stage, mm -hmm. and um, so my alum, uh, one of my alumni friends, uh, recommended knew that I they were looking for 
going to be looking for a, a director of alumni relations at Miami University in Miami. So I said, well, I don't want to look like I'm looking for a job, so if you will invite me to come be a consultant uh, about your program, which we all kind of did, you know, mm -hmm. um, that um, I'll look over the situation and, you know, I'll interview with the president and that sort of thing, but I don't want it to look like I'm really looking for a job. So that's what I did. And I don't like, I don't like Florida. I don't mm -hmm. like hot weather. I don't, mm -hmm. that's just not my thing. I, did, I just really, and it didn't make me like it any better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I declined that. But the word got out, of course. So some of my <coughs> alumni director friends would, would recommend me for different places. So I happened to know that Bob Foreman of University of Michigan knew that the Rutgers position was coming up, and he recommended that, I con that they contact me, and that's how it happened. Okay. What year was that when you joined Rutgers? 85. 85. So you had, you had gotten your Ph.D. in 82, is that right, mm -hmm. in communication? And then you were involved with, you were on the Board of Trustees of CASE from 83 to 85, so probably your name was really getting out there yeah. amongst um, yeah. the professionals. Um, do you remember what some of the major initiatives were or, or um, projects or goals of CASE when you were on the Board of Trustees, things that would have been important to you to move forward? Well, the thing that I was most interested in, again, was this business of the advancement of women. Mm -hmm. Someplace, I'm trying to remember when, I remember talking about it with my parents, but um, at least my father. Um, but after um, I'd been working at Purdue for a while, and it may have been around this time and around this subject, um, I sat myself down and I said, what are the things that are most important to you? So, oh, okay, um, family, um, security, that's still related to family mostly, um, and um, the advancement of women. If I'm going to go for a cause, that's my cause. You know, that fits in with with my interest in developing leadership in Alpha Xi Delta. Um, I have been working toward the advancement for women in my profession because when I started with Case, one of the first things I w was doing was uh, figuring out how to communicate um, the uh, the things, the workshops and so forth that Case was offering, uh, and it was for men and women, but the ones I was interested in were the fact that uh, all, most all of the directors were men, and most of the subordinates were, a lot of subordinates were women, and for whatever reasons, neglect as much as anything, nothing conscious. Uh, the directors would get these mailings about opportunities, and we were having some special opportunities for women, but they never got the message because th they'd get into the wastebasket before they got to down to the staff. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, let's develop communication with directly with these women. All we have to do is get their names and addresses and send the stuff directly to them. Mm -hmm. And so we tried that in District 5, which was my district, and it was being helpful. So anyway, the, that fact, that, that was what I was most interested in in a case, at least to start with. Mm -hmm. And um, there was still tension in case at that time. Um, because, and I think it's just a matter of fact, that 
the development people make the money. They bring in the money. They don't do a damn thing about recruiting people in the beginning, but they make <laughs> they pull in the money and they get the credit for it. And so they were getting a lot of attention and universities were encouraged to have these big campaigns and so they'd hire these big staffs and and they worked. I mean, they made a lot of money and that was good. Um, but those of us who had been in the trenches all these years nurturing their alumni weren't getting any points for that. <laughs> so there's always this little bit of jealousy, I guess, really, mm -hmm. and for the attention that we weren't getting. So there's some of that going on pretty much all the time. What were some of your strategies for advancing women in the profession? I know you already mentioned you know, the idea you had to reach out directly to women to try to communicate that you were, that, that Case was doing things to try to mm -hmm. develop them. Um, what were some of the things that, that Case did to help women? Well, I don't know that um, we, they did develop some uh, special um, programs that were supposed to be appealing to and helpful to women. They were tr also conscious of not of trying not to look like they were uh, neglecting men and in favor of women, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was open to everybody else, but um, Jenny Tyler was really the only person on the case staff that um, was um, working on um, or had an awareness of the special recognition and needs for women. And I don't um, remember anything other than the communication aspect. And of course, she was a communicator, so that was her ability and resources were available to her in that area. So. Um, Except for maybe a few workshops, I don't know that we were doing anything special for women. Um, one of the things we were just really trying to get recognition and, uh, you know, pointing out that women were contributing and were able, and um, and it was working. I mean, they were moved up now, but there are a lot of women that are directors now mm -hmm. of alumni associations as well. So a big part of it was just raising awareness that this was an issue. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. And that was, I mean, it, there wasn't anything malicious about it mm -hmm. or anything. It was just, mm -hmm. hey, knock, knock, we're here. Right. And I mean, think that's true of women in any profession, really. Mm -hmm. Were you seeing, as the development field kind of branched off, were you seeing a similar um, gender in, imbalance, I guess, there in the development field as well? Or was that a mostly... A, a male-dominated yeah. field. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so, I know one of the things that um, you're you're well known and recognized for is is making the, your work to make the profession more diverse. And is that um, relating to what you were talking about with the advancement of women, or is that something else that you that you did in your career? I am? <laughs> <laughs> what brought that to your attention? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I guess inspired by my recognition that women were not being uh, recognized, I felt, for their contributions. Um, I, I mean, I feel that way about anybody that's, you know, struggling at the lower levels and just needs a break now and then, yeah. um, like they give to other people. Right. <laughs> you received um, the Consumer and Family Sciences Hidden Diamond Award oh. in 2001. Well, me, and, me and 50 other people. <laughs> I, mean, I was as surprised as anybody. I do have that picture of that. Um, they made a printed a little flyer type thing with the pictures of all of the people that were recognized. So mm -hmm. I I'm didn't sure know. there was a reason. Could you well, tell us Well, I don't know. I, when I was on 
um, when I was on the staff at Purdue uh, and the Purdue Alumni Association, um, it was, uh, well, the agricultural alumni, uh, this kind of ties in with my constituent society stuff. Um, the agricultural alumni had their own alumni association. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And still do. Mm -hmm. um, nobody else, nobody else, none of the other schools had their own. Mm -hmm. And Joe Rudolph was quite resistant to having any other. That, but agro is bad enough. They yeah. didn't need any more complications. And, but um, the dean... Uh, the school of what was then, I don't know which name it had at that time, probably still home economics, um, wanted to um, get her alumni involved and wanted to, I mean, they were to some extent already, but she was trying to expand that. And uh, many of us were members of the American Home Economics Association and um, that had gatherings and we would see each other then and mm -hmm. some people just continued to be involved. Um, so there was interest in, you know, women like to get together, you know, mm -hmm. and if nothing else. So she saw potential there for developing a group that would be supportive of her school. And uh, so I said, well, um, we we give it a shot. We can just call it, you know, our own little club or something. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I said, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And eventually we got that organization going and we got a 501c3 and we could collect our own dues and stuff like that. What was that called? I don't know. I I I was just thinking, what did we call it? Because I I think of it as the Home Economics Alumni Association, but I don't think we could use we use the word association. Uh -huh. Hmm. That's forty years ago. <laughs> so was there any pushback from your boss for you being involved in that? Oh, it was like everything else. <laughs> He'd let me do anything I wanted to do as long as I did it and I didn't neglect anything else I was doing for him. He always said, do whatever you want to do as long as you get this done, you know, and that done and whatever. So, okay. <laughs> were there particular things about um, people who were alumni of consumer and family science that you, that you thought it would be good to target messages to them about? thinking about your early work <laughs> and targeting messages. <laughs> I, I don't remember actually uh, being very conscious of that, but we certainly knew our constituents and, you know, knew what they'd be interested in, so mm -hmm. subconscious. That particular group didn't fit into one of my worldview things very strongly, so mm -hmm. we didn't necessarily have a particular way of communicating to them. So you, um, there, there are so many things we could talk about beyond just your career as, as an alumni um, leader. So I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about when you, when you transitioned to Rutgers, how was that environment or work different from <laughs> <at> Purdue? <laughs> oh, now there's a good one. Well, number one, I was moving from Indiana to New Jersey. Right. Uh, I had been warned about the East, you know, but and I knew people <laughs> out there and so forth, but I didn't have any problem with them. So, um, well, several things. The first meeting I had out there, and it was part of the interview process, um, they were interested in hiring me particularly because I was from the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. And the president, Ed Blaustein, at that time, was very interested in um, making Rutgers more like the other land-grant colleges mm -hmm. and the ones that were particularly successful in 
the relationships with alumni particularly were the Big Ten schools. So, and they were very interested in, and they were also very uh, renowned for research mm -hmm. and um, grant money coming in mm -hmm. for the research. So he was trying to model Rutgers on those uh, descriptions and um, so I happened to be a hot commodity from the Midwest and, um, and he was hiring a lot of other people from other Big Ten schools. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't alone in making that transition. <laughs> Um, so I had uh, an interview, a lunch with, with my guy that was going to be my boss and, and the boss of the development. He was the advancement vice president. So he, um, so that's why I was an assistant vice president. And so was the development director. Anyway, we had, um, lunch and, um, they were describing what the situation would be like here at Rutgers. And um, one thing that they really needed was to get the alumni records and development records coordinated so that um, the giving that was coming from alumni could be recorded by the alumni system. At that time, when I went there, the university computer system was taking care of all this, and we were low priority, and they didn't like doing what we had needed to have done, and they didn't know how to do it anyway. I mean, they weren't specialized, in that. Mm -hmm. so they weren't doing a very good job, and um, so that was one problem. Another problem was that the director, okay. Another problem was that they had alumni associations uh, related to their various colleges. They did not have one overarching uh -huh. alumni association. And President Blaustein wanted it like the big, other big schools where you just have one big happy family. Mm -hmm. And this was a separated unhappy family. And the biggest alumni group were the Rutgers College alumni, who were the original school, had all these old members, all these old white men with a lot of money, and um, some of them had been very loyal to their old red flag, you know. And um, so they were, they had their own alumni director who was the most uh, rigid old boy you could ever imagine and he had his little clique of leaders that he treated very well with mm -hmm. with alumni funds he would take them to football games to a, you know other schools they were playing mm -hmm. that kind of thing and um, just a lot of old boy favoritism going on and of course he was very popular with his, his buddies and um, he was very independent. He didn't like to do anything anybody else wanted him to do or whatever. Had a hard time getting cooperation. And had very, had no young alumni program. I finally got that going. Um, but um, it was really to the disadvantage of the other alumni associations of the other schools. Douglas is a women's college and they had their own alumni program and they were all very loyal to it. They did not really want to share anything much with anybody else. But they were better than Doug other than Rutgers College. They weren't at least they were nice people. <laughs> they weren't greedy, selfish, <laughs> whatever. So anyhow those were just a couple of the challenges. And I never forget that they offered to fire this alumni director of the Rutgers Alumni College before I came. 
They said, I know it will cause a lot of trouble because he's really popular with his little clique, you know. And some of them were on the board of trustees and all that. So I said, oh, no, that's okay. Well, I'm sure we can work it out. <laughs> How many times I wish that I had not said that. <laughs> because it took about, let's see, I was there nine years. It took at least seven years, <laughs> probably, six or seven years, to get rid of him. But we finally did. Actually, it must not have been that long because it was before President Blastine died. But anyway. So was that, that was part of your um, position there, was kind of seeing them become more of a centralized That was a major system. part of the job. Interesting. And they had tried, mm -hmm. but they had failed and given up. What, how did you succeed at this? Um, well... I think mostly it was a matter of uh, helping the other alumni associations realize that they deserved to be recognized and that they would get along better if they cooperated mm -hmm. and we could share resources with them if they were all one body. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we started, uh, well this is another whole story, but the Rutgers College had a couple of insurance guys that had already started an insurance program for Rutgers College mm -hmm. alumni, but it didn't include everybody else. Interesting. And, um, and I, saw, I said, oh, well, no problem. I had connections with the insurance people that we were working with at Purdue. I said, uh, how about you just coming in and offering your insurance program to everybody, mm -hmm. including the Rutgers people if they wanted it, but they've got their own program, we won't worry about that, we'll just offer it to everybody else too, mm -hmm. you know. And so they became popular and they began, and uh, all of these alumni associations got their share, you know, of the resources. Oh, that worked, didn't it? <laughs> and finally we got the Rutgers College group in with ours. That was another whole thing. Um, so that was really one way we um, we basically I just worked with the other fifteen alumni associations mm -hmm. to help them be successful, and Rutgers College could either participate or not. But since we were successful, of course, they wanted to do this too. And ultimately, I even got the young alumni program and uh, the other one. So, so you started the young alumni program there. I just insisted that they have one, yeah. <laughs> How were you able to convince them of that? Well, by that time we'd gotten rid of this other old goat, and uh, we had our own director in there. He wasn't a whole lot better, but uh, he was younger <laughs> and recognized the value of it. Bring him up now while you've got him. You've got a connection with them as students, so mm -hmm. I'll bring them right in. That's great. It was mostly a matter of teaching. You know? Right, right. Um, I know that you also served as chair of the Board of Planned Parenthood of Indiana. Would you like to talk about how you became involved in that? Well, that see, that's way? another thing, uh -huh. advancement of women. I think, you know, I don't know what your feelings are about these things, but uh, I was concerned about young women giving up college because they got pregnant mm -hmm. or giving up high school even, as far as that goes, um, giving up their opportunity to prepare themselves for advancement in the world. And uh, so I've been very active in Planned Parenthood since 1980, probably, something mm -hmm. like that. I've been president of three Planned Parenthoods in various places where I've lived. When I first, at first in West Lafayette, I don't know, there was Lafayette, actually, it was where the clinic was located. But in any case, uh, when I moved to New Jersey, they whipped out a message to the New Jersey people you need to get acquainted with her. Oh, they were on the lookout. <laughs> oh, yeah, they welcomed me. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Uh, so then I became president there. And um, then when I came back to Indiana, I, of course, I was notorious by that time anyway. And I actually, at the, t at the time, it, we had Clint, uh, the Indianapolis, I forget how many we had, but we had clinics all over the state and um, they weren't, they were independent. They weren't a statewide organization. Mm -hmm. And we just kept, they kept needing more resources, more support. And we kept saying, we can save you this much money by centralizing. Mm -hmm. and we've got the computers, we've got the staff, we'll take care of this and solve your problems, whatever. So um, we acquired all of the ones in uh, Indiana while I was president, like we finally got the last one when I was president, mm -hmm. and uh, then after that they've acquired Kentucky, which only had two clinics anyway, or clinics in two towns, I should say. I see. How do you feel about the the political changes that have happened over the last couple of? You don't really want to make <laughs> me sad, do you? You want to make me cry? <laughs> oh. No, I, my solution is, number one, I know, don't watch cable news ever, and any, I mean, plus or minus. Um, I subscribe to the Washington Post online. I read the uh, Indianapolis Star, much to my regret sometimes. <laughs> no, I think it's pretty balanced anymore, since it's been taken over by Gannett. Um, and I try, you know, I try to understand the point of view of the conservatives in Indiana. I was brought up here. I love these people. I forgive them their stupidity, and <laughs> I try to get along. I belong to a church, basically in Carmel. It's on the borderline of Carmel and Indianapolis, and so you know they're mostly conservative people. And um, I love all of them, but, uh, and many of them are not happy at all with the situation as it is. But they feel like they're stuck with it. Um, I don't know how they rationalize it, actually, but. So, uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm getting too old to campaign much to do anything about it, unfortunately. All my family are very liberal, so that's all I care about, you know. We don't have any arguments about that. My brother's an Episcopal priest, and he's as liberal as anybody. And uh, all my kids are supporters of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Actually, I think most of them now are, well, two of them are asking that their Christmas presents be given to Planned Parenthood. Uh, one of them, my son, is a conserv has decided he wants his to uh, the National Conservancy. That's just fine. So we're making progress. <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, I have heard that you always wear blue. Why is that? <laughs> well, it turned. It was started as a very practical decision. Well, I look nice in blue. I've got blue eyes. What are you going to say? So. Um, I didn't even think about it when I got dressed. I just had blue. Um, but when I was doing a good bit of traveling for the Purdue Alumni Association, it occurred to me that my friend Carolyn, from when I was in second grade, um, and still is a friend, um, has red hair, and she always wore brown, orange, uh, yellow uh, and those colors all went together she always had something to go with whatever she was wearing because the colors look nice together mm -hmm. well that's interesting I don't like any of those colors but I could do that with blue so I have blue overcoat blue shoes blue socks um, blue purse, all navy, this is all mm -hmm. navy, mm -hmm. because that's the foundation for whatever else I want to wear, and then the colors that I wear on top are 
white, blue, pink, whatever goes with blue. So that's that was a practical solution to a problem <laughs> that has lasted for uh, 60 years or so. Mm-hmm. In fact, even, even when I was getting a master's degree, I was wearing a lot of blue, not necessarily exclusively, uh, to the extent that the husband of one of my f- co master's students um, called me Mary Blue. Huh. So, so apparently, some even those. then, it was obvious. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I, that was before I started was traveling with, with Purdue anyway. So, what do you just looking back on a long and accomplished career? What what is what do you consider the the highlight of your professional life or your most significant accomplishment in your career? Well, you know. I only was employed for pay for 21 years, which is not a very long, you know, there were 10 years when I wasn't out mm-hmm. earning money. I wasn't, I wasn't putting any money into Social Security, I can tell you that. Um, so my career is not really, and I've been retired longer than mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you know, and it's been a long time ago. So it's hard for me to value that like most people would. Mm-hmm. My career is not the most important part of my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did well in it, and it was fun, and I accomplished some things, and I have a lot of friends from that era. But it's hard for me to value it mm-hmm. as, I don't know that I value anything else but anymore. <laughs> I mean, of course, I've my best accomplishment is my children but um, for whatever credit I can take for that but um, that's a very interesting question the other thing is I don't know how how anyone else would value what I might value um I think at Purdue, I probably, well, okay, let me take the other way. At Rutgers, probably the most valuable contribution I made was to integrate the alumni program. Interestingly, um, they had several presidents after the president that I worked for, and I, Mm -hmm. I was hired by, I should say, and worked for it for the longest time. After he died, or in office, after probably about halfway through my time there. Um, There were several presidents who were really so bad (laughs) that the governor wanted to fire them but didn't have the authority to do so. (laughs) It was was public knowledge. Um, She tried. Um, But... um, It was a, you kind of just ducked, you know. You just, I didn't ever even work with them directly, which is kind of a bad thing. Um, anyway, so several presidents in between. Finally, I think it was two years ago now, um, the, pr- the current president, was re- who had been president for about four, three or four years, four or five years, not too long. Um, who was, had actually been a professor at the college, and his father had been a professor at the college, and I knew his parents. Um, anyway, he was retiring, and he had a call, or had a page in the alumni magazine, in which he said one of his one of the things he was proudest of in his uh, time as president was the fact that the university now had a universal alumni association. And I'm thinking, thank you. That's nice validation, isn't it? He was very proud that it happened in his watch. He didn't have anything to do with it, probably, really, but 
uh, but I, I was glad he was proud of it. I, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of validation for my efforts way back then when everybody had forgotten all about it. But yeah, so that would be my best contribution at Rutgers. I, I don't know, at Purdue, I, I broke some barriers. I think I gained some, a lot of respect for women. And um, I was, um, and as I said, I was, I, I, was, I was allowed to do anything I wanted to do, so I tried to do good things. <laughs> I would, one of the things that I did was uh, the technology program has school, and I don't know if it's how true it is now, at that time had um, technology programs on several of the campuses of Indiana University at their regional campuses. Mm -hmm. And so every year they would have maybe 30 or so alumni in their graduating class who were really getting Purdue degrees, but they'd taken their courses at those campuses because we had a few technology professors go out to those campuses and teach some of the courses they needed, and then they got their liberal arts credits and so forth from Indiana University. But they didn't, they, their degree was a Purdue degree, just like you do at the regional campuses here, you know, the, mm -hmm. or any place. That if you're a joined campus, you get your Purdue degree or you get your IU degree. So anyhow, except for Indianapolis, I was sent to all these regional campuses to welcome the Purdue alumni, all 20 or 30 of them, into the Purdue Alumni Association because they were being welcomed. The rest of them were being welcomed into the Indiana University Alumni Association. So the dean of technology and I would go with the platform party of Indiana University to all on their airplane to all of these regional campuses oh. over one week. We'd go to each, all of them. Some there were two a day sometimes. So, so I got very well acquainted with the Purdue, with the Indiana University uh, trustees and the president, and you know, uh, it was an interesting little sideline of, of mine. So that was kind of fun. So Indiana University was on board with what you all were doing. It sounds like there wasn't any concern about, uh, you know, kind of encouraging that loyalty back to Purdue, even though they were on the IU campuses. No, they no. knew they were Purdue people. Well, there were so few of them. What did they care? <laughs> they still had hundreds. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that was fine. Well, is there anything else you would like to share for the record today? You've pulled out of me everything I have, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I haven't uh, gone, gone too far. Um, Not at all. But there's, there's a lot there. Um, so. well, I wanted to uh, share with you one little thing. This has to do with the um, Council of Alumni Association Executives, which is a subgroup of case, uh -huh. sort of. I mean, they're... Uh, and the people on the front row here are the officers of the original, of the founding part of the organization. And um, this is our 25th anniversary reunion in 2014. We're already planning our 30th now. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and this is held at Devil's Head Resort in Wisconsin. Um, they have a uh, conference there every year, have had. This started by the Big Ten alumni directors. Mm -hmm. Then it became the Council of Alumni Association directors. And um, it started out being an invitation-only type thing where the directors of the larger alumni associations would come. And I think now they let anybody in, but anyway. Um, so these are just some of the people that came to the, I was the secretary of the first, of the founding or, uh, organization. That's great. 
So you were in that first group whenever they formed. Yeah, I was a charter member. And the, all the guys on the, everybody, well, a lot of people who were there were in that first founding group. Mm -hmm. So, and we were founded in Coral Gables, Florida, actually, is where we met. But, um, Do you remember what caused the group to, come to, to form? Well, because um, the Big Ten directors were having their own little devil's head meetings of just the directors, not the associate directors. Uh, one time, for example, the uh, Joe Rudolph, my boss, and the director at uh, Indiana University were supposed to give a speech about something at this what they had workshops and so forth at this conference, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as playing golf, mostly playing golf and eating and <laughs> drinking. But other than that, uh -huh. uh, so anyhow, Joe said, we'd like for you to draft our speech for us. Here's what we want to talk about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I don't get to go to the conference, but I get to write the speech. Thank you very much. In the meantime, the Big Ten associate directors were having our own get-togethers, so and we did that in Chicago. Um, but anyway, so, you just so the but after a few years, uh, many years, of the Big Ten directors having their meeting, they decided, well, because they were asked by other alumni directors, other alumni directors asked if they could come because they wanted to get in on this sharing of information and the good times. So they said, oh, okay. So they would invite some of their friends, and then they'd invite their friends. And so it just began to grow, and so they said, well, this is getting out of hand. We can't handle all this. There's no point in our handling it ourselves. We're going to form an organization and get more people involved in the planning and making the arrangements and everything. So that's really why it started. So that's when it opened up to mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. uh, alumni levels direction. Of, yeah. uh -huh. So the Big Ten and the Big Eight and the Big Twelve and the Big whatever it is by now. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, but now anybody, I think pretty much anybody can come. And then, um, worse yet, the finally you know after fifty years or so, um, some of those old guys started retiring. Well, they were having so much fun, they wanted, still wanted to get together. So they started the Council for Retired Alumni Professionals, C-R-A-P. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> the, uh, the, the president, where's the picture? Do I, oh, you have it over there, okay. Uh, the president of crap. <laughs> is Bob Foreman, the former director of the Michigan Alumni Association, and his buddy, um, Fred Williams, who was the director at Arizona, so he was one of the later coming on, you know, not Big Ten, and um, although he had Big Ten roots. And Doug Dibbert is actually still on staff, or still the director, at... Uh, West Virginia, and I'm from Rutgers, but and mostly Purdue. Everybody thinks of me as being from Purdue, mostly, um, and uh, because that was Big Ten. And then, of course, Rutgers is now in the big whatever it is. Yes. So, anyhow, we were the first officers of the charter group of this group, and so Bob and Fred are president and vice president of CRAP, <laughs> only Fred's title is privy counselor. <laughs> oh, wow. Bad. <laughs> oh, they're so bad. <laughs> so they have continued to be included in, in the CAAE as well. I see. Well, thank you, Mary Ruth. I, I really appreciate all of your time and sharing these memories with us. Well, it's been a blast. Thank you. You've made me think of things that I had forgotten, so thank you. <laughs>